Hello, everyone, and welcome to the midweek program at the J.C. Ralston Arboretum. My name is Blake, and I'm the education assistant here at the Arboretum. And today we are outside of the townhouse garden on the far side of the Great Lawn, because there are a, a whole mess of plants over here that are beautiful and delightful. They've delighted our curator, Dennis Carey, who's pulled together a program for you. Today we're doing Dennis's top plant picks. So we are surrounded by a bunch of plants that are looking good this time of year that Dennis would like to share with you. So it is going to be a wonderful program. Alrighty, those of you joining us on YouTube, please like this video, subscribe to our channel, and feel free to leave a comment down below. And with the announcements out of the way, I will pass things over to Dennis to share with us his top plant picks for September. All right, hello everybody. So I was asked to pick some of my favorite plants for September, and I was thinking about it as like, what do I like in September? And what I really like are the plants that did well tolerated all this summer heat. You know, we had that big drought in June and ridiculous heat in July and ridiculous humidity in August. And so what are the plants that uh, look good this time of year and that, are, that, I, that I enjoy? And so I've got a few selections for you today. Uh, the first thing I'm gonna talk about is salvia. Uh, if you wanna pan over to the salvia behind me. Uh, so just in general, uh, salvia is a good plant for th this late summer, early fall. Um, a lot of them will bloom over a very long period of time or they'll have a flush of bloom and then they go away and then they come back uh, and they come in a wide variety of colors. And uh, they are, for the most part, sun loving. There's a few shade lovers, but we'll talk about the sun loving ones. And they like, they love heat and a lot of them, most of them can tolerate good a bit of drought too. In fact, it's better to plant salvias in drier spots in your garden than in the wetter spots. So the one we're looking at is a, a, a salvia. It's a hybrid salvia called Big Blue. And uh, it was uh, selected uh, because it's an improved form of an old favorite called Indigo Spires. Uh, it is a hybrid between uh, a Mexican species, Salvia longispicata, uh, which is not hardy and has long flower spikes uh, of bluish flowers and a blue form of Salvia farinacea, which has really, really, really nice blue flowers. And so we got the best of both worlds. We got a taller spike than regular farinacea, and we got the blue flowers of the farinacea on it. It is also an upright growing Salvia, uh, which uh, depending on how much space you have in your garden might be important. Uh, a lot of salvias, Gregii's and Microphyllas tend to become these kind of hemispheres, half, half spheres. They kind of flop out and become this round ball. Um, this you can see is there's uh, stems coming up out of the ground and then it flares open. And so it's, it's a different shape and it might be a better shape for a particular spot than a, than a bigger, wider plant. Um, it is about at its maximum height. Um, this particular salvia, there are others that get much taller and others that are a little shorter than that as well. Uh, it's a good perennial. Oh, deer don't like, in general, don't like salvia. Now, I, as soon as I say that, I know some of you are out there thinking, well, I have a salvia and the deer are eating it. Yeah, uh, uh, most deer don't like most salvia most of the time, I guess is the safest way to say that. Um, and it's a favorite of mine. Um, I have uh, several different salvias in my yard. Uh, they come in a wide variety of color forms. I'm gonna tease some of these flowers out. This is big blue, close up, it's that one there. And then uh, one of the parents of big blue is Salvia farinacea, which uh, here's a white flowered form of Salvia farinacea. And uh, there's a, a blue flowered form as well. And it's a very nice Salvia, blooms. This one started blooming for us um, way back in like April, March, real early, and it's been going all summer, okay? Uh, salvias, different ones can have really hot colors. Uh, so you don't have, just have the whites and the blues and the purples. You have, this one we'll call, this is like a, a, a Microphila type. Um, a, we'll call that um, uh, uh, hot pink, I guess would be the best color. You could call it, and there's a lot of hot colors in the salvia world, this is more of the same. And here is another uh, 
another pinkish one, magenta. Here is a dark purple Garnitica. This is one of my favorites, or this is a hy hybrid with Garnitica in it. And it's the flowers are dark purple, and then uh, the um, tissues below it are almost black. They're so dark purple. So you get a really, really dark color. They have the, and I cut these just 30 minutes ago. They've already started to, to wilt, but uh, they are, the flowers are tubular and uh, hummingbirds love tubular flowers because that's perfect for their, their beak and their tongue to get down in there to the nectar at, uh, at the bottom. And so um, in my garden, the number one hummingbird plant is Salvia garnetica which is not red like most some, you'd think most hummingbirds like, it's actually a, a, a blue or a purple. Uh, so that's salvia for you. Um, a really, really good late summer, September plant. A lot of them, um, uh, the ones that kind of went into remission during the summer are now coming out again and look, and look really nice. The next one I wanna talk about, a favorite of mine is Calicarpa americana. Uh, the American beauty berry. In fact, uh, if you translate Latin and you break apart the word Cali Carpa, that's beautiful fruit or beauty berry. Um, and so that's kind of where the common name comes from is, is from the uh, genus name. And uh, Americana, of course, is a native shrub. It's a deciduous shrub and it is coming into its full glory this time of year. Okay, so Cali Carpa Americana produces these incredible colored berries. Uh, are you focusing in on the berries right now? So um, I'll go ahead and point to this one here. And uh, this is, we'll call this the typical Calicarpa Americana berry color. And so you see at every leaf node, you get this cluster of berries um, all along it. If you go further down, these older ones are in more in color. And then these are ones that are gonna color up later in September. This is uh, the typical color. Now this particular variety also, I, I got a separate branch. It is variegated. And again, I cut this 30 minutes ago, it's already wilting, but um, uh, this is called berries and cream uh, for the uh, variegated foliage. I wanna show you uh, another purple flowered one. And this is one that is behind me up against the fence. If uh, you can focus on that. And then I can show you the up close berries of it. And I'm actually gonna set it next to berries and cream. Uh, and this is more purple. And you can see it is also an Americana. It is uh, a slightly different shade of purple and it is also a real nice purple. There are a few color selections. Uh, more purple is uh, one of those color selections. And another color selection is this white one here. Uh, and this is actually a Calicarpa Americana variety Lactea. So this is a naturally occurring white flowered uh, uh, variety, uh, white berried variety of uh, beauty berry. Now, if you like white, uh, that's great. Uh, I, per I really prefer, I like the, the, the dense colors, the, the really rich colors myself, but s some people really prefer this. We have another one, a Calicarpa Americana, right next to the white one. Uh, and it's uh, not quite at full color yet, but if you want to get back here, um, this is Welch's Pink. Uh, Welch's Pink is a JCRA introduction from a few years ago. Uh, and so if, if you like pink instead of purple, then Welch's Pink might be the selection you want. Uh, so why do I like Calicarpa? Well, the berries, for me, it's the berries, but it is also, uh, is also in the Lamiaceae family. And so deer generally don't like it. They will nibble it. Um, they generally don't go after the fruit until after the leaves have fallen, um, and they will nibble the leaves sometimes, but it's deer-ish proof, okay? Uh, birds love these fruit, okay? And uh, uh, I just heard a story that uh, uh, in um, a garden, a blue jay landed on a branch and was doing that dipping bird thing, just dipping down and getting a berry and eating it. And so, uh, and there's over 40 species of birds that uh, will eat the berries of Calicarpa americana. So it's a very, very good plant to support your local wildlife. And of course, um, those of you who enjoy watching birds uh, will get a kick out of just watching the birds have fun on the branches. Um, they will only go for the fruit typically after it's in full color. You know, it's a, I guess these are sour and these are sweet. Uh, the berries are actually edible. Uh, they are not particularly flavorful. Um, and earlier in the year, I was talking with 
John Bittner and before that talking with John Dole um, uh, and they make jam out of the uh, Cali carpet berries. It's very mild flavored, just a mild sweetness. So, so uh, Dennis, Darla says that her Cali carpet berries look like they're drying up this year before they've changed color to purple. She's wondering why that is. Drying up. You know, that could be um, a delayed reaction to the drought because mm -hmm. you have this drought in June, puts the plant under stress and actually can stress the roots and, and they start to die back. And so even though we've had rain since then, it might be impaired in, be, in its ability to take up water sure enough. later on. And that actually could progress into full on root rot and uh -huh. plant death as well. Yeah. So the, the solution is not necessarily to keep watering the plant. Right. Uh, first stick your finger in the soil and see if the soil is wet. Um, that's the first thing my brain goes to, but it could be a mulching thing, mm. you know, um, it could be a, um, the soil is too heavy mm. kind of thing. Um, Cali Carpas uh, like moister garden sites rather than drier sites. Um, and uh, uh, the salvia is like the drier sites, but these like the moister ones. And so it could be um, uh, the soil is too dry or sure. it's too, too dense, the too clayey for yeah. the roots to spread out in. Awesome. There's a variety of things that could be happening there. Absolutely. All right, so these are Calicarpa americana, uh, and uh, a few examples. There, we have something like 71 different taxa of Calicarpas in the garden. That's how important we think here at the JCRA that this plant is for the ornamental landscape. And they're not all Calicarpa americana. Uh, there's a lot of, there's close to 200 species of Calicarpa. And um, we have uh, 71 plants in 30 something taxa, 31 taxa. Um, and many of those are not Calicarpa americana. I brought a few for show and tell. Uh, this one here is Calicarpa dichotoma. And this is a cultivar a selection called Isai. It's on the market. It's easy to find. Uh, it's a little bit smaller leaved than Calicarpa americana. If, um, if the texture uh, of this plant is important to you, uh, then you might go with Dichotoma over americana. In my opinion, the fruits, they are colorful and pretty, but they are not as large or plentiful as americana. Um, uh, so it's not quite there fruit wise. Um, the branches this is more of an arching plant. And if uh, you want that arching form or texture in your garden, this one is a, a very nice texture. Uh, Calicarpa americana is kind of a wide, ungainly shrub, uh, loose, and it droops a little bit, but it's more just kind of out there. Um, and this is more kind of drooping down a little bit. It's, it's, it's a nice texture, especially once you have an older plant that is filled in. Over here, um, I can't go without talking about some of the breeding work done by uh, Tom Rainey in the Mountain uh, Horticultural Crops uh, Institute in Fletcher. And he is breeding um, uh, uh, hybrid cultivars of Calicarpa. This one is called Purple Pearls. It's not the newest on the market. There's an even newer one called Purple Glam, which is better than this. I just didn't have one to show you today. And it's got the smaller berries um, and it's not showing its, its famous uh, trait right now. And the famous trait is that the leaves have a purple tint to them at certain times of year. Okay, and so this specimen, which is um, fairly old, ours is uh, uh, more than 10 years, I think, um, uh, 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 is not showing that trait currently. And that could be a, because it's in the shade or it could be that it's getting older or it could be a time of year thing. I'm not exactly sure about that. But the, um, one of the, uh, uh, in addition to the purple leaves or purplish leaves, um, this one has an upright habit. Whereas Americana and, di and Dicotoma are this kind of outward droopy thing. Um, uh, this one, is solidly upright and it's got a form not unlike the salvia where it kind of goes up like that. And it's also quite tall. Salvia, uh, a Calicarpa americana is, we'll call it a six by six, six tall, six wide, maybe a little bigger. Um, uh, dichotoma, similar. Um, this guy here is over, the specimen we have is well over 10 feet tall and maybe eight or nine feet wide uh, at the crown. And it's, it, it, the stems are bare at the bottom. We've probably pruned it like that. 
Carolyn says yeah. that she's heard that Japanese calicarpa is an invasive, and she says that she has lots of them sprouting up all over her yard. She wants to know your opinion on the matter. So um, calicarpas do come, come up from seed. All of them will. Um, and uh, I don't know enough about Calicarpa japonica to mm. say, but yes, if it's if it is a nuisance seed wise in your garden, it will. The birds are going to eat those fruit and poop them out everywhere, not just in your garden, but in the forests and in wild places. And then it will come up there too. And yeah, so if if it tends any kind of plant that, uh, uh, especially one that's not a native, that it tends to seed around too much and too much to the point where it's actually out competing. Uh, and forming big uh, 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 groupings of plants that outcompete natives or, or just shade them out. Those are the bad ones. It's not necessarily bad if a plant ends up in the wild and it's just one plant and then, you know, 100 yards away, there's another plant and that those are fine. Those are called plants that naturalize in the wild and, and that's fine. But the ones that form these thickets that really kind of drown out uh, the natives, that is bad, especially if it's one that does not support wildlife. Now, Calicarpa does support wildlife, so there's a check in it in the plus column for it. But yeah, uh, if it's too seedy, then don't keep it. Yeah, get sure. rid of it. Get an Americana. There you They're go. An excellent plant. Uh, oh, I want to show you this one is another uh, uh, non native species. It's one I really like. And uh, I don't know if you can see the difference. This one's not in full color, by the way. This is another month or more from full color. Uh, this is Calicarpa oceamensis. It's got the smaller leaves. Um, and it's got huge numbers of berries in each berry cluster. And when the berries do turn, they're gonna be a dark, dark purple. Um, it's an extremely beautiful plant. It's one of my favorites here at the Arboretum. And like this hybrid, it is more of a, an upright shrub and you can limb it up and it actually make it into a small tree if you want. Um, and so that's Calicarpa for you. Um, let's see if I have any other good notes. Oh yeah, um, so like I said, you wanna plant this in somewhat moist or evenly moist situations, mm. not, not dry, not salvia. These don't go next to your salvias. Uh, and um, you can prune them hard. They will come back if you prune them way back real hard. Uh, and you can prune them, they, they bloom and, and fruit on new wood. So you can prune them late winter, early spring. Uh, and to control the size. You don't want to prune them, prune them in the summer uh, or in the fall, you're taking away the, the berries. Okay, um, that is the second plant I wanted to talk about. The third one I wanted to talk about is Lycoris radiata. If you want to pan over to uh, the red one that's right here. Lycoris radiata is a, in the Amarilla Dacia family uh, and deer really don't like to eat that too. This one that I selected for today's talk is a late blooming one. We're kind of at the end of Lycoris season. Okay, and uh, this is one called Modern Japanese. All right, when Lycoris bloom, when they grow from seed, the, the, the children will all bloom at different times and they bloom over a relatively long period starting as early as July and ending, uh, and, they, and ending in September, we'll say. And each one will bloom for a couple of weeks. So if you have a bunch of different ones, uh, you can get a long bloom period or you can get a whole lot of one and just get a really big bang of color at one time. Uh, both are good <laughs> ways to do it. Uh, this is modern Japanese, which is one of the later blooming ones. Um, over at Plant Delights, Tony Avent's got a big Lycoris collection and he is um, separating them out by bloom time. He's getting them from different people and different sources. And this one's an earlier one, this one's a week later, that one's a week later. And he's got you know 10 or a dozen or more a Lycoris radiata that he's given cultivar names to. Um, that uh, bloom at different times. So you can do that technique of either going all in on one or spreading it out. I like Lycoris. It does so well in the late summer, early fall because it avoids summer altogether. It's a plant after my own heart. It goes underground and stays cool all summer long. Uh, comes up to flower here in late summer, early fall. And uh, then uh, with no leaves, that's just a bare stem coming up out of the ground with a, with a flower on it. And then later on, the flowers will die. If they get pollinated, they'll make seed. And this stem flops over on the ground and plants the seed a foot away from the parent plant. Uh, and um, uh, 
uh, then after that, the leaves come up. And so it's like a, you could call it a winter green. Okay, so the leaves are this little strappy thing, not much different than like a rain lily or something small. And then it's in leaf all winter and into the spring. And then when it starts to heat up, you know, we get start getting those hot days in June or whatever, the leaves are gone and the plant hangs out in the cool uh, for the summer. Very smart plant. So Dennis, uh, Jared says that he received and planted a few different Lycoris from Plant Delights and he wants to know if they will bloom the first year in the ground. Yes, uh, so when Plant Delights does them, they are selecting flowering size bulbs and putting them in the pots. Um, and each pot should have more than one bulb in it. If when I, Back when I worked there, um, if I remember right, they were putting two or three bulbs in the pot. And of course these things, the bulbs divide readily. So you'll all, if, if you've had it in the ground a few years, you already have more than that. And, uh, and so uh, it's readily, um, it readily, readily divides. And yes, it should flower first year, um, uh, uh, barring incident or something, sure. you know, yeah. uh, and, and, you know, they might put three bulbs in the pot and only two of them are big enough to bloom or only one of them is big mm. enough to bloom, but they bloom pretty quick. Uh, they size up pretty quick. And in fact, over time, you're, you, you'll get this clump of bulbs just attached to each other, a big clump of bulbs, and they will, the flowering will actually diminish as it gets too crowded. So you dig that up, separate those bulbs, replant them, spread them around, and you'll regenerate, rejuvenate the flowering. Uh, so this is like chorus radiata, variety radiata, uh, modern Japanese. Uh, there's a lot of like chorus. This is one that Tim picked for me just before I came on line today. Uh, this is a, uh, a, a cultivar called Albi Pink and there's a uh, Lycoris albiflora, which is whitish. And then uh, it's a hybrid. So it's got some red in it from somewhere else. So you get these pinkish colors. Um, if you wanna pan over to uh, uh, Alexander over to the one I showed you before. That one, um, oh, I didn't write that one down, but that is, uh, that's like an albiflora type and it is mostly white. Uh, if you got up close, there might be a little shade of pink in it as well. So there are other colors. There's these reds, there's these whitish ones with some pink in them. There's some um, yellow ones, chinensis and others. And uh, there are hybrids that are multicolored that, and some of them have uh, blue tips to the, um, to the reddish flowers or the whitish flowers or the blue tips. So there's all kinds of color selections and it's a very, very fun flower to have because it just comes up seemingly overnight. Uh, it's a great, uh, I love it in my own garden and here. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, it's common name, it's got several common names. It's got the common name of surprise lily because it blooms before it leafs out. It's got the common name of hurricane lily because it blooms during hurricane season here in the southeast. Uh, and it's got the common name of naked ladies, again, because it blooms uh, and is beautiful um, before it leaves out. So that is Lycoris radiata. And they like, they do actually do best in part sun. So if you can give them afternoon shade, they'll, that's what they'll do best. You can grow them in full sun. Uh, Tony produces his in full sun because uh, they will, they, more photons means they, they propagate faster, but they will flower best in part sun. Uh, so these over here are getting a little bit of shade from the nearby shrubs uh, and, and things like that. All right, so the next plant I wanna talk about is Gallardia estivalis. And I'm gonna start with this yellow one. Um, and yeah, if you wanna uh, pan over and uh, to the clump over there, uh, Gallardia estivalis uh, is, estivalis by the way is Latin for summer, and it blooms uh, over a long period of time in early summer, kind of takes a, uh, during the heat, heat of the summer can take a, a break. This yellow one doesn't, but the other ones do. And then in uh, late summer, uh, it, it comes back into full flush. Uh, this particular one, this yellow flowered one is Gallardia estivalis, and it's a cultivar name of Glitz and Glimmer. That was just a cultivar given to a wild type that was found that it had a nice yellow color to it. It comes true from seed, so you don't, you know, you can let this seed around and it will stay yellow. Gallardia is uh, called a uh, lance leaf blanket flower, and a lot of you might be uh, more familiar with the other Gallardia that's both red and yellow, uh, uh, sometimes called Indian blanket or just plain blanket flower. 
and uh, that is uh, a shorter lived uh, perennial and it dies easier. This one is tough as nails and it uh, grows and spreads. The patch that uh, Alexander has got the camera on right now is probably four or five feet wide. Um, and then another 50 feet on down, we've got a patch that's easily 30 feet wide and it's only a few years old. So it spreads um, via rhizome and via seed locally. It doesn't jump all over the place, but locally it really does fill in spots very, very, very nicely. It's why I like it and it's why I picked it. So uh, that is Gilardia estivalis, uh, Glitz and Glamour, the yellow one. Uh, and I also have, there are other Gilardia estivalis and I have a purple one. And this is a, a, a purple selection of this white one. Uh, this is Gilardia estivalis uh, variety Winkleri. And uh, this is a cultivar called Grape Sensation. Uh, this one hit the market several years ago and is, is pretty well established in the trade right now. Glitz and Glamour is maybe five, been on the market for five years or so, um, and it's doing quite well. This white one here is Gallardia estivalis variety Winkleri, and this is just the wild form that's white. And this is a, a an all purple selection of it. If you, if you look really closely at the base of the white, you'll see that there's a little tiny bit of purple in there and this guy got confused genetically and uh, put the purple everywhere instead of just at the base. So um, native plant, so there's a good uh, a check in, in, the, in the pro box. Um, birds, uh, uh, goldfinch, uh, like to uh, eat the seeds. And if uh, Alexander wants to pan over, you can see this one here is, not only is it, parts of it are in full fresh new flowers, parts of it have um, just newly spent flowers and parts of it have um, seeds that are coming off in that white fluff. Uh, goldfinches like to eat those seeds. It produces, especially Glitz and Glamour, produces copious amounts of new flowers all summer long. Uh, it's extremely floriferous and uh, um, it supports uh, wildlife. It likes xeric sites, so that would be a good one to plant with your salvias. Uh, it is native to kind of xeric flatlands from North Carolina down to Florida and over to Texas, so southeastern U.S. And uh, butterflies also enjoy the, the flowers. Does not like wet soils in the winter, so make sure um, you put it in a place where it drains, especially when we get a lot of winter rains. All right, so that is uh, 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 Gallardia estivalis. Uh, and the next one I want to talk about and this is a longtime favorite of mine, if you wanna pan up and look at the shrub behind me. Well, it started off as a shrub. Uh, it is now a 30 foot tall evergreen tree, uh, and it is sold in the trade as a shrub. If you go to a, a garden center and buy this, uh, and it's in a lot of garden centers all over the Southeast, um, it, they, the tag will say, this is a 10 foot tall by 10 foot wide evergreen shrub. And this is a 40 year old specimen uh, and it didn't never learned how to read, so it not, never read those tags, and it has grown way, way up. Uh, this is Viburnum awabuki, and the cult of our name is Chindo. Uh, now we have it in our system as Viburnum awabuki, uh, the epithet awabuki, but you also see it as Viburnum odoratissimum variety awabuki. Okay. Um, and that odoratissimum epithet should tell you something about the flowers. Uh, they are very fragrant. They're very small, little white things. Uh, they're not, not so showy, but they're quite fragrant, uh, which is a great uh, trait of this plant. Uh, the shiny evergreen leaves, another great trait of this plant. Uh, and if you can pan in, you can see we're at the end of the fruiting season, but it does produce uh, red berries and they will eventually turn black if the birds don't eat them first. The birds are doing a real good job on this one, eating it, and so you're supporting wildlife. Now this plant is, uh, the species itself is from uh, China, Japan, and Korea. This individual cultivar came from Korea. Um, J.C. Rossum himself in 1985 went on a plant hunting expedition to South Korea, and he was on the island of Chindo uh, looking for plants and found this in a schoolyard and thought this was an extremely nice form. Um, usually odoratissimum, the leaves aren't, they're, they're duller and this one has really nice shiny leaves on it. 
And so he's like, well, that's cool. And uh, that's a quote. And uh, <laughs> he, so he brought it back to the US and planted it here. And then we released it as very early on as a JC Ralston Arboretum selection. And it is now established in the trade all over the Southeast. It's a really good plant. Uh, and so again, real shiny evergreen leaves, almost magnolia like and uh, red berries, white fragrant flowers in the spring, small, not so showy. And um, uh, it's just a great overall plant. It's a good story too, which I like. I looked up what awabuki means, because uh, uh, I'm into trivia and I like that sort of thing. Awabuki translates from the Japanese as, where is it? Um, uh, foamy or frothy, okay? And that's referring to the flowers. Um, uh, and uh, the, the name Viburnum comes from Latin and before that from Etruscan. It, it's just the name of a particular species of, vi of Viburnum, Viburnum lantana, uh, which means wayfaring tree. And so I guess you can translate Viburnum as wayfaring, sort of. And so uh, it's a great plant, lovely shrub, lovely evergreen shrub. And uh, I have one more plant to talk about. Do we have any questions? I've been asking them as we go. Uh, oh, okay. Rick just chimed in about Viburnum alabuki, the age old question, do deer eat the foliage? Uh, I wouldn't put it past them, but I will say this, deer don't like thick, leathery leaves with a lot of flavor. Now, the, they, I don't know about how those taste, but they are thick and leathery leaves. So they will probably eat other things first. Sure. Um, and so, once it gets to a certain size, they can't reach yeah, them Yeah, they can't anymore. reach them, right, right. So. For sure. All right, so I have one last plant I wanna talk about today. And if you'll pan over just to the uh, right of the Viburnum chindo is a uh, um, Acer palmatum uh, variety cultivar called Seriu. Uh, I selected this plant because here at the JC Ralston Arboretum, uh, Acer palmatum, Japanese maple, was one of JC's very favorite plants. And we have kind of an unwritten rule here at the Arboretum that no matter where you're standing in the Arboretum, you should be in sight, in view of a Japanese maple somewhere, okay? Uh, so I selected this one. Seriu is a cut leaf form, and it's an unusual for one of the cut leaf forms, the dissectum forms, because most of them are uh, weepers, okay? Low growing, wide, and then they weep down. Uh, Seriu is an upright, uh, cut leaf form. Uh, it, it's the only or one of the only uh, cut leaf upright ones. So that's really good. When the le when it leaves out in the spring, the leaves have uh, are they're green with red tips. Uh, so that's kind of pretty. And then in the fall, we're not quite at fall color yet, but in the fall it will get yellow shades of yellow orange and and some red in it. So Seriu, I looked that one up too, and that is Japanese for azure dragon. Very cool name. You, did you know that already? I did know that one. Yeah? Yeah. Um, so uh, Azure Dragon is a mythical um, creature in Japanese and Chinese mythology. And it is also, I guess, in charge of uh, the element of wood. Mm. Uh, if, you know, we have the four elements in our mythology. I'm, I'm assuming wood is an element in Japanese mythology. So there you go. Uh, it is also, uh, it's so much a part of Japanese mythology that they have a lot of things named Seryu. It's a male name, um, it was a mountain range called Seriu, and there is a Japanese maple called Seriu. Do you happen to know how old that particular specimen is? I don't, I did not write down the age of that one. Um, I, would, I would guess that's well established. Mm -hmm. I would guess that's 30, 30 years plus. Sure. Yeah, that's, a, that's as big as it's gonna get. Uh, it is, but it's really pretty uh, uh, dissected leaf. That'd be great to put a chair underneath. Oh yeah. Um, because of the, the section would let some light through, but you get to look up and see all that really fine texture. Really, really pretty. For sure. So that is just, I mean, I have hundreds of favorites. Uh, so that's just a small selection of my favorites. Uh, the ones that I like for the month of September. That's awesome, Dennis. Great. That's really awesome. And we knocked out the questions as we went. And oh, I am, I'm kind of, you know, spinning my wheels a little bit, seeing if there's any more questions that come in. But you know. how are we for time? Do we? We've, we've, we've accomplished everything we need to accomplish. We can accomplish more if our hearts desire and if we are prompted to do so. Well, that appears to be all of the questions for today. So thank you so much, Dennis, for pulling together this presentation. Sure. I told him, I said at least 20 minutes, that'd be good. And yeah. You, 
you you fluffed it up. Way to go. Oh, did I? Okay. Oh, good. yeah, for sure. I'm glad we did. And, and, and it wasn't it wasn't pointless information. It was all good information. In fact, you answered people's questions before I had a chance to pose them to you. So it's like you were reading people's minds and and filling in the gaps. Well, anyway. I was. So, well, yeah. I mean, obviously, that's that's how good we are here. We know everything about plants and everything you know about plants too. So. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> thank you, Dennis. Sure. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. We will be back next week, next Wednesday at 3 o'clock. We will be joined by our director, Mark Wethington, who will be doing a little bit of reminiscing, telling you if I knew then what I know now. So some of the lessons he's learned, some of the wisdom he's gathered in his years as a gardener. So that should be a wonderful program. We hope you all will join us then. We'll see y'all then. Y'all take care. <laughs>